you for joining us for Achieving Survey Grade with SLAM-based LiDAR mapping. Our first speaker is Emerson CEO and co-founder, Dr. Stefan Harper. Stefan has been in the forefront of drone autonomy research and development for nearly 20 years. Thanks for the intro, Kim, and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be here today to talk a bit about what we've been doing recently um, with the, the launch of Hovermap ST and the automated ground control feature. Um, which goes with it and explain how we can use that to, to generate survey grade um, results with the SLAM based system. So before I start talking about the new hover map, I do want to at least um, pay homage to the original hover map, hover map HF1. Um, you know, this was a, a product we first launched just over three years ago. And it's been amazing to see how this has been adopted in industry and the impact it's had. Um, it's become really well known for its versatility, the fact that it can be used on and off a drone, um, the ease of use, um, the quality of the maps that it produces, and also the, the autonomy that it provides, um, allowing drones to, to fly into areas that are really hard to, to reach, to, to capture that um, very hard to reach data. So it's been great to see how this has sort of changed um, industries in many ways, and it's still the only plug and play autonomy LiDAR mapping system that you can mount on a drone or take it off and use it off a drone as well. Um, and it's been a workhorse uh, in many industries. Um, just a few examples of types of data that Hovermap has been used to capture in these industries, uh, GPS denied around complex cluttered environments. And obviously it's been put to use in some very challenging and harsh environments. Um, as you can see here, this has been a, a system that's been used underground in a mine where it's a very, very um, challenging environment. So it's been great to see how the map's been used, um, but obviously there's always room uh, for improvement. So when we started looking at how we could um, uh, develop the next generation of hover map, we looked at where we could improve um, on this existing great technology. Um, and a couple of areas we identified were, first of all, the IP rating of the system. Um, as you can see, it's, it's used in these harsh environments. So being able to improve um, the IP rating um, was, a, was a key sort of factor we wanted to do. Um, because it's drone mounted, size and weight are always a, always, um, a factor. So we were aiming to reduce the size and weight of the system to allow it to fly on smaller drones or have uh, longer flight times. Um, and then also with the orientation of the LiDAR um, to, to see if we could improve point density of points uh, below the drone if you're flying sort of above ground of, of open areas um, without impacting the collision avoidance capability. Um, so yeah, we wanted to try and improve these, these things, but without um, uh, impacting the map quality or the autonomy capabilities. So not a, not a hard problem to, to solve. Um, so yeah, really excited to, to have launched Hovermap ST, which really addresses these problems. Um, this has been in the works for more than two years um, of R&D and extensive testing, uh, you know, many hours of, of use in, in harsh environments um, during that testing. And I think our engineering team have done an amazing job of addressing those challenges uh, that I mentioned. Um, so it's you know, really been redesigned from the ground up. We're obviously a lot of learnings in the original hover map, and we've taken those into account when um, designing and developing uh, this new version of hover map. So the, the key thing is the, uh, it's built from the ground up to be um, uh, tough and weather resistant. Um, and it now has achieved IP65 rating, uh, which is amazing. It means you can use the system in rain or in very dusty uh, conditions. Um, we've also managed to reduce the weight down to 1.6 kilograms, or just over three and a half pounds. And we've also reduced the size um, by 20%. So this means you can fit it into smaller spaces and it's just more convenient to, to use. And we've also managed to increase the temperature range that it's suitable for. So down to minus 10 degrees Celsius now. Um, and that means, again, it can be used in, in cooler environments as well as uh, warmer environments up to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, but the key thing is really the, yeah, the IP rating. I mean, it's made a huge difference. Uh, as I mentioned, it now can be used in, in these uh, environments where, there's, where it's wet or dusty. And we've managed to achieve that um, in a couple of ways. One, one is to remove the, um, the air intake outlet vents of the original hover map. So it's now totally sealed um, and it's cooled with an actively cooled heatsink instead of using that sort of airflow through through the device. Um, and also the materials that we've used and the way it's been sealed up allows it to reach that IP65 rating. Um, some other things we've we have kept um, the Velodyne LiDAR. We still use the Velodyne LiDAR um, which has up to 600,000 points per second when it's used in dual return mode. 
uh, with a range of up to 100 meters. We've also kept our quick release mechanism. So that allows you to quickly and easily um, take hover map off the drone and mount it onto other accessories. And that means um, the new hover map is compatible with those, out, those previous mounts that you might have. A couple other small things. So we've, we've combined signal and power into one connector at the back. So it just makes it quicker and easier to, to connect hover map onto a drone just with a single connection. Um, and another really exciting exp um, accessory uh, capability is the accessory expansion port that we've added. So this is a set of pins below hover map together with hot mounting points, which allows you to attach accessories um, and feed those directly into hover map. So we can power the accessory and read signals from um, the accessory. Um, and this will enable a whole host of new applications. For example, something we've been developing um, is a long range radio add-on module. So this is something that will attach to the bottom of Hovermap SD and extend the, the range for communications uh, for Hovermap. Um, other examples could be a gas sensor. If you're flying in an environment where you need to measure gas, we can, uh, we can mount that directly to Hovermap and read those readings in, uh, through the accessory expansion port. And for those of you that have um, been following us through the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, you might have noticed that we're actually using Hovermap ST through that challenge as well. Um, early prototypes and then the, the final product actually was used in the final. And for that um, challenge, we also in, uh, developed uh, an accessory which mounted onto the bottom of Hovermap, um, which included cameras. And that was actually used for the detection um, part of the, the Subterranean Challenge. So again, this allowed us to, to provide new capabilities with, with Hovermap, and we extensively tested it through the um, DARPA Subterranean Challenge a couple of years. So a lot of those changes are visible from the outside, um, but under the hood, there's a lot more going on as well that's not so easy to see. So just um, showing this in a exploded view diagram, and I'll mention a few of them. So uh, first of all, the uh, compute power has been increased and improved. So we're now using um, an a, in, uh, in, in industry grade embedded system odd module. Um, so that's got more compute power and will enable Hovermap to um, perform more complex autonomy capability um, as we develop that. Um, and then also the front motor um, assembly. Uh, previously we used uh, a brushless motor directly attached to, to Hovermap. Um, we've now re totally redesigned that and we have a um, a dedicated and uh, custom designed motor assembly, which includes a high resolution encoder. And this will help to improve um, the map quality as well. And then there's just other things like choices of materials. So the, the front um, assembly is all machined aluminum, very rigid and stiff. And that's important when we're connecting the LiDAR to the IMU model, module um, to have rigidity to improve map quality. And then the outer housing is a tough, um, plastic, which is uh, weather, weather sealed and, and, and rugged. Um, so that makes a big difference as well for um, the, the versatility and, and uh, use, use, usefulness of Hovermap. Um, in terms of autonomy, uh, Hovermap ST is still compatible with the same drones as before. So this is the ACE Core Zoe. Um, we've maintained autonomy compatibility with this platform as well as the DJI M300 um, and also the M210 V1. So you can attach Hovermap as before and provide autonomy capabilities. Um, we've also ensured that our colorization capability is maintained. So you can mount our colorization module to the bottom of Hovermap and produce really rich detailed colorized point clouds. Today's talk is more around the, the mapping side of things, but I do want to mention just briefly the autonomy. As I mentioned, we've we've kept obviously the autonomy capabilities with Hovermap ST, which allow you to fly into uh, challenging areas using our tap to fly capability. So um, just using a, a live stream map um, stream to the tablet, you can send it into GPS denied areas beyond line of sight, beyond communication range with omnidirectional collision avoidance um, and perform guided exploration uh, to, to reach those really challenging areas. And then obviously ensuring it comes home uh, smartly when it's uh, batteries running low or it encounters uh, excessive dust, et cetera. And as I mentioned, we do have this live stream uh, capability. So that's streamed back to your, your tablet as you're mapping. And that really helps to make sure that you've got the coverage that you need while mapping. Um, 
And the new feature we've we recently added is the ability to actually download a point cloud directly from Hovermap. So obviously we're, we're running SLAM in real time for the autonomy and we now use that SLAM output um, and make it available to be downloaded through the, the USB thumb drive instead of having to post process that on the, on the laptop. And then lastly, um, the automated ground control feature and, and Jordan will go into a lot more detail, but I just wanted to um, sort of give the rationale for why we've um, developed this capability and why I think it's gonna be a, a game changer. Um, so obviously SLAM has uh, got a reputation now for being very uh, versatile, quick to use and allows data capture in, in areas that were previously not really possible. Um, but it does ch um, have some challenges. There are some environments that are not well suited to um, SLAM-based mapping. And also there's usually an additional step of georeferencing after um, the point cloud's captured. So we're really looking for something that could alleviate those two problems um, and together uh, enable SLAM-based mapping to be used in, in new environments. So what we've come up with is this automated ground control feature where we, you know, you know, we have um, targets which are placed in, in the environment um, and we wanted to keep those as simple as possible so that they could be easily uh, manufactured by anybody so it's it's, it's just a um, reflective disk and we wanted to uh, make sure that the workflow wasn't impacted um, so you can keep scanning and, and moving at the same time you don't have to stop at each um, ground control point so that speeds up the workflow and also in the post-processing workflow we've um, put in a lot of automation to make sure those targets are detected and um, we do constellation matching. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, let Jordan go into a lot more detail in a couple of slides. And then lastly, um, from my side, I just wanted to point out we are, we've actually released um, our point cloud viewer as well. So this is included with the GCP feature. And this has uh, been developed from the ground up um, to focus on loading very large point clouds very quickly to view them. And as part of the, the ground control point feature, this viewer pops up um, as an option to, to view your point cloud and uh, the TCPs, but it is a standalone point cloud viewer. So you can use that to open your last files very quickly and easily. Thank you so much for that, Stefan. And our second speaker is Jordan Herman, Emerson Te Technical Sales Manager. Jordan is a highly regarded mining professional with over 16 years of experience using LiDAR for mining applications. Thank you, Kim and Stefan. So GCPs, um, it's not really a new term. Uh, ground control points, they've been around in especially the, the aerial surveying uh, market for a long time. And, uh, you know, why do we really need GCPs? It kind of really helps tie into control. And again, from that like aerial surveying or photogrammetry aspect, it, it allows that to distort and shift control. Uh, for Emerson, it's eliminating drift, accurately positions data, and uh, has a whole range of um, improvements. So GCP benefits in a nutshell, server grade accuracy. So really honing our point cloud to a known truth and known set of ground control, correcting drift, um, but then automatically doing it in that same step. Um, the targets are automatically uh, detected so that they're just a reflective disc, um, automatically detected. And uh, it means you remove any cumbersome manual picking or, or finding a centroid of a target. It's all automatically done. Um, when it's fitting to that uh, coordinate system or, or control network, it's non-rigid. So it's not a block puzzle piece shift. It is changing its shape to suit control. Now that control can have geoids, um, can be ellipsoidal heights, can be a, a line of sight, um, like one scale. Um, so it really comes down to what information you're feeding in and how much your, your um, overall scan may change. Uh, with these targets being a reflective disc that is observed from a distance, there is no need to stop while you're scanning. So scanning on a car, scanning on a drone inside of weird little places, or even if you're walking around, there is no uh, need to be stationary to incorporate control in your data set. Um, and again, like the, the best thing I like about this is it's automatic. And um, part of that is making sure your, your target layout is a unique shape. So not, you know, all in a straight line or a, a perfect square. That's not ideal because it's an ambiguous shape. Whereas setting them out in, in a right network of control really helps improve accuracy and the, the automated aspect. The GCPs themselves, um, 
in the video, and as Stefan mentioned it, and I've mentioned as well, automatically detected. Uh, we have a few different options. Um, standard sort of offerings are a 250 millimeter and a 500 millimeter disc, um, as well as swivel targets. So discs, they can be mounted on the floor, uh, out in fields, out in paddocks. Um, I'm also using magnets to attach them in industrial areas to, to hand railing, stair railing, um, even just steel fencing and things like that. They're, it's a quick and easy temporary adhesion. However, for long-term deployment, like in static storage facilities, like stockpiles, you can permanently attach them, of course. Um, for the underground mining markets, swivel targets that fit straight into existing wall stations uh, really allow a seamless flow of information um, from data capture through processing uh, through various technical service departments as well. So it simplifies that whole use. Now, we refer to a term constellation uh, and constellation matching. And uh, our whole GCP process kind of works by identifying these bright reflective disks. The software sees them as a bright reflective disk. So it's a higher intensity. And then we then fit some criteria to that, so filtering, to make sure it is actually a disk, a GCP, and not just a, a number plate or a street sign. Um, it is a, an actual GCP. Now, the term constellation matching um, this is a photo from my travels up to Queensland. However, when I look at the night sky, I see stars. I can recognize stars. I recognize constellations. I know that shape fits a shape in my head. So I'm remembering things. Emerson's doing something similar. We're finding reflective disks, shining little stars out in the scene and matching how that shape between those reflective disks really hone into our control network. So again, it's, it's automatic. You don't need to pick a centroid. It knows how that shape needs to fit. So here is a, a quick snap of the um, Emerson viewer showing some targets that are detected and little green lines. So you can see from a distance how they're, they're sort of pulled in. And again, it's a block shift to that coordinate system and then a non-rigid fit to survey control. So how does it all work? So in the Emerson software, those who have seen it before, uh, it's a very simple user interface, drag and drop some files. You can tweak settings here to, to hone in on different reflectivity materials if you're not using a standard target type, as well as allow the software to pause for manual target review. So that's if I want to confirm target matching prior to a, a GCP process. However, with experience, um, laying out that shape in a, a non uniform or ambiguous layout really helps hone in uh, that automatic detection and assignment and projection as such. Importing survey control, generally just a CSV or a text-based file um, with the, the coordinate ID or, or point name, uh, the coordinates themselves, and there is an optional radius uh, bit of piece of information here. Really that's a code for the software to understand the, the radius of the target or the size. And it means you can allow different sizes in your scene. So if you were flying a really large area, you probably want a larger diameter or radius uh, target to be observable from a greater distance. Then if you're flying through a heavily wooded or congested area, you can use a smaller radius target and have them all in that one scene. It is optional if you're just using the one target diameter um, or radius, you can just pre-populate that with the default. So the Emerscent user interface is uh, really straightforward. To drag and drop information, you specify your, your control point functionality or, or enable that. So confirming settings, it, it remembers your defaults. Drag and drop in your, your survey file. Like so, just confirming the right number of targets. So this, this data set's quite small. There are three known targets, but four points. There's a little bit of time lapse going on here, but the total time for this processing is uh, less than a minute. So there's, there's three real stages that the Emerson software runs, and that's a, a local, a global, and then GCP projection. So local is really about matching uh, the LiDAR kind of as you're moving and producing that SLAM result. Global then revisits that whole result, looking for overlap and, and matches in the, the bigger picture. GCP projection, is where it's finished its constellation matching and then refits that to your control. 
Once that's processed, so again here, 34 seconds, 15 seconds, uh, there is a big constellation button. This will open up the Emerson viewing software for you to confirm how things have tied in. All your targets that are detected are listed as well as your control points. So control points H1, 5, 6, and 3. My target candidates have been automatically assigned. So I haven't need to do any input. The output for this, this task is actually correct without any intervention. However, if you do need to manually assign a target, so this was a spare one um, in the boot, you can drag and drop those targets to line up. So it's not, it's not manual picking of a centroid, it is detected and then you can tell it which coordinate it belongs to. So that was a real small data set for a larger one, lots of targets, automatically detected. You know, it's a bigger constellation, so it really only fits in one shape. Again, trying to eliminate that straight line set of coordinates or square ambiguous shapes. This is an example of a uh, park right adjacent to where I live. And uh, this survey was done with a total station, um, surveyed just from one location with a, a, an array of checkpoints, some GCPs placed throughout the scene. Um, everything was observed from the, the high point shooting across and uh, allowed a really good, I guess, examination of uh, information pre and post GCP. So the GCPs in the scene were 350 millimeter uh, diameter, so 175 radius, as they were kind of laid flat, they're bigger targets, um, laid flat throughout the scene, as well as the, the smaller ones, which I use with a, a magnetic backing and attached to just fencing and framework around the place. You can also see a checkpoint up the back. This is the curb edge, so a concrete curb uh, adjacent to a bitumen road. Uh, three checkpoints in that area, mainly showing the X, Y positional change here, but then also the elevation. So that's a, a hover map point cloud overlaid with survey checkpoints and just confirming elevation lines up. You can really see that curb edge quite clearly as well. Various checkpoints throughout the place, um, fencing, sheds, other objects. Um, these points aren't as good for elevation checks because it's not like a, a known point that's visible in the scan data, but more the XY offset. And again, it, it lines up perfectly with survey control or check. Various other walls all scanned. We also uh, shot in tree trunks and a park bench and yeah, a whole array of uh, check shots. One of the things I love about the, the hover map coming from a predominantly terrestrial laser scanner background um, is versatility. And like Stefan mentioned, you know, the one sensor being able to walk around with it, drive around with it, fly around with it, enable full autonomous capture through heavily wooded or obstructed areas, flying underground is, is awesome. So this whole scene, being able to capture with a different scanning device is not unheard of, it would be straightforward. But then scanning underneath a culvert in a creek area, all in one data set, in a matter of less than five minutes for the whole area, is uh, pretty mind blowing from someone who has a terrestrial laser scanning background. Another accuracy analysis I performed was over a 900 meter loop, uh, walking around, used 10 GCPs. And key here is the, there was one area that's about 180 meters, um, 170 meters between GCPs. So you can see my walking path on screen here, and it curves around and zigzags around places. The checks were more elevation checks rather than an XY check, um, simply because of targets. There was 81 checkpoints, um, all captured just with a 15 second observation time. And uh, they were also captured three months after the actual scanning was done. Um, the overall loop, you're looking at a, around that plus or minus 20 mil mark. Uh, again, with GPS sort of floating around the place, three months between, I was quite impressed with that. Um, summing it up, 10 control points, 81 checkpoints, uh, mean distance between the two was 11 millimeters. Now, SLAM really requires features. So SLAM for that simultaneous localization and mapping is, is shooting lasers all around you as such. Sounds really cool when I tell my kids that. Um, but it's it's building a 3D world as you're moving. It it does really need good features to make that happen tight 
So one of the, the best ways GCPs improve things is in featureless environments. So thinking of like smooth concrete line drifts, um, very smooth tunnels or featureless areas, it, it has a big impact. These two tunnels are near my house and uh, were scanned with a terrestrial laser scanner as well as hover map as a comparison. So tunnel one, it's a, a corrugated iron uh, lined or corrugated steel lined uh, railway tunnel. It's uh, cross-sectional dimensions are very similar to that sort of underground environment that you would typically see in mining um, with five and a half meters by six and uh, with the TLS it took 14 individual setups with 62 minutes of scan time. The hover map scan that we're comparing to was one walkthrough. We did have multiple GCPs. It was 97 seconds of acquisition and uh, no loop closure. So start at one end, finish at the other. The adjacent tunnel is a services tunnel, so it used to provide communication lines between two townships. Um, it's very, very smooth. It is narrower, but it does have uh, some steel work in there. So some features, however small. This was an additional 18 scans. Again, that narrower field of view um, with the terrestrial laser scanner, and it took a further 71 minutes. This whole area took one additional hover map scan. Again, no loop closure. There was only three GCPs in this tunnel and one where the start and finish was near the adjacent tunnel for a total time of less than three minutes. So summing it up, um, 120 meter lengths or 110 meter lengths and uh, two hours, yeah, about two hours, 15 minutes of scan time with the TLS and uh, quite a lot of processing time to, to tightly register that. Uh, the hover map was less than five minutes of scanning time and, and the automated GCP process took less than 20 minutes, including all that registration to a, a GDA 2020 control network. So the two hover map scans you can see here, there's no closure between them, they're two individual scans. This is a show of the little TLS and um, the GCPs used. GCPs again adhering to steel with uh, magnetic information. Now, how much does that GCP influence? Now, again, thinking of such a featureless environment, in the center, the, the hover map was a little bit lost without GCPs because there's nothing big there for it to detect from a distance. So it actually had quite a, a drastic improvement here. Now, the accuracy of hover map is great in that fully feature rich environment, but featureless is where it, you know, can get a little lost. So you can see quite a large jump in target to control here. Overlapping cross sections between the two data sets. So after GCPs, uh, the hover map data set is nearly exactly the same as our TLS data set. On the ground areas, same aspect, um, lines up perfectly with railway sleepers and uh, normal material. You can see the tripod leg from the TLS here. So summing up, you know, GCPs are really essential for ensuring an accurate point cloud, especially in that featureless environment. Um, you know, the, the data sets were near indistinguishable once you'd done enough filtering and cleaning, and it was 10% of the time. Now I'm, I'm not really saying that, you know, uh, hover map and TLS are the same, but in certain tasks, hover map is faster and just as accurate. TLS is on a whole more accurate. So it comes down to really what you're trying to get out of it, what your task requires. Where I find GCPs really, really awesome, uh, really large topographic areas where you're, you're scanning big, broad, open places with no features. So here you can see a GCP highlighted green beneath this flight. Big long structures, so this was a flat jetty structure um, that produced for BIM, uh, BIM mapping, I guess, or structure mapping. Roads and transport areas, so being able to overlay GCPs and have instantly corrected or rectified data without jumping through additional software hurdles is, is a huge savior. As well as if it's a longer term project, permanently mounting control so you can scan daily basically blindfolded and the data just fits. So construction, so small scale construction, this is multi-story, but really a small area that was scanned. It can help tie things in to be, you know, millimeter precision, as well as larger construction areas. Of course, you, you're gonna have a bigger quantity of drift over these big, large areas. 
stockpile volumetrics, you know, scanning inside of structures is a, an interesting one. And uh, we are seeing an uptake of autonomous flights in uh, stockpile areas to, to get different vantage points and remove people from having to traverse over them. Having targets observable from a distance means that anybody can go in there and scan and uh, get a point cloud that is fitted to a known control network. So all your volumes are just printed out to the same base every time or same bin as such. So, and of course, stockpile is in a, an open air environment. Now, predominantly we're seeing a lot of photogrammetry in these places. However, for inclement weather or uh, running volumes at odd hours, odd times of day, being able to put the same hover map sensor on the bonnet of your car and drive around really quickly to pick up a point cloud that is accurate and repeatable to, to control that's permanently mounted really simplifies that, that offering. So, and it just adds versatility to the same device. And I guess that the biggest impact of GCPs in a mining environment are really those long underground drives. So long chainages where there's, there's no identifiable features from, from one side of your data set to the other. So having GCPs slotted into wall stations that you just cruise on by in your light vehicle allows for a really fast rectified point cloud. And uh, honestly, I, I can't state it enough that uh, in these drives, it makes a, a huge impact, especially when you're going up um, elevation changes. So that the vehicle itself uh, does send a little bit of vibration to the unit and GCPs just rectifies anything out that it needs to. It's, it's a lovely addition. So. If you have any other questions or would like to get in touch, please reach out to Emerson through our website, emerson.com, or by email at webinars at emerson.io. Thanks again to our speakers and um, to you all for your time today. Mm -hmm.